I be, before we get officially started here, I want to introduce the panelists, and we'll do something else before we actually get into their reminiscences. All three folks up here you saw were in the movie, so in case you don't recognize them. They all played a big part in the resistance. So we'll start uh, first here. This is Mandy Carter, lifelong... Uh, lifelong community organizer for the War Resisters League West, the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, the National Black Justice Coalition, and Southerners on New Ground. Manny Carter is a Southern African-American lesbian with a 52-year movement history of social, racial, and LGBT justice organizing since 1967. Mandy Carter. Everybody. Winter Dellenbach was co-founder and organizer. There we go, Winter. <laughs> co-founder and organizer for the Los Angeles Resistance. She lived communally for 23 years, was a public interest law attorney, and remains an advocate for low-income people and a political activist. Winter. <laughs> Winter. Bob Zaw on the left. <laughs> You're right. Bob Zaw was in the resistance. He left UCLA grad school, turned in his draft cards, refused to take a physical, refused induction, and defended himself in federal court. He headed up Peace Press for 20 years and has been involved in issues such as organizing the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant and nuclear testing. That's opposing that, by the way. I'm leaving out that word, opposing. <laughs> Recently, his orga organized re-entry work for Amnesty case Gary Tyler and showing the boys who said no film exclusively at colleges around the L.A. area. Bob Zaw, everybody. Um, I'm going to ask Sarah Smith to come up here. She's going to do a, a quick tribute to some of the folks who aren't able to be with us today that were in the film. Uh, Sarah became part of the L.A. resistance in 1968 after returning to the U.S. from two years in rural South India with the American Friends Service Committee. She has been an activist for women, children, and families as a midwife, preschool teacher, labor and delivery nurse, and started the Family Health Education Center in Santa Cruz in 1990 and then began working as a hospice. Hi there. So I have been asked to um, help have a moment of time to pay tribute to the people who were in the movie, who were involved in the draft resistance, who aren't here. And they died. <laughs> um, so the journey for this movie really came from Christopher Jones having the idea that it would be great to get the stories of these people while we had time to get them down. And um, so part of what we're our honoring is Christopher and um, Todd Friend is another, all of these people I know, so it's a little challenging to just hold the movie and the moment of everybody's involvement and determination to have this story told. And um, Todd Friend is another person, one of the ones who was burning the draft files. Um, I met my husband on the steps of the L.A. County Courthouse at their trial. <laughs> and um, so Todd was a wonderful person, too. And... Um, and then Joe Mazelich, more recently, just in the past year, passed away, another person who just played a critical role in many different activities on the way and all the way through until the end. You'll hear more people talk about them. You'll hear some of the panelists talk about them, too. Um, and then last but not least, David Harris passed away in uh, February this year. And... Um, I just, I, as many of us have seen and heard, his, his way of reaching people was really spectacular. He had, a, he had a capacity, and that's what drew me in at a, um, 
draft resistance meeting in LA and and I swear he looked out and he just went and you <laughs> and, I was like, and he said you women you need to think about this is not just a men's movement you need to think about it, what this means to you and what you can do and it just changed how I thought about my ability to participate in the draft resistance after that and so I want to just take a minute to have us all just have a moment of silence and reflect on the power of people speaking up and taking a stand and making a difference. Thank you. And so I guess I just want to say I'm thrilled to be able to have these people be our panelists and hear what, what they have to say and what they can share about what, they're, what they've done and what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I get to start. Um, first, I want to thank Sarah. Um, I've known Sarah a long time. She was a, a midwife for me 51 years ago. We've known each other a long time. Uh, at first in LA and then at Struggle Mountain, um, Commune, Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, so thank you for uh, helping uh, put this event on today, Sarah. Um, LA Resistance, the resistance, the work that we did meant everything to me. Uh, it utterly changed my life. Uh, the first thing that happened is that uh, the war in Vietnam, when that happened, I was a girl that came from a small town in Southern California, Pomona. It was very provincial then. It was an orange growing town. And when that war happened, I, I went to UCLA and it just cracked my consciousness open. Uh, it couldn't be denied what was what uh, was happening there, and I started to pay attention. And then I went to that April 15th march. I flew up for the day in San Francisco. I went on that march, and I heard David in Kesar Stadium. And um, then I heard him at UCLA not too, too long later. And I was invited to be a staff person and to, mail, uh, to open up uh, the LA Draft Resistance Office in June of 67. And by the head of the philosophy department at UCLA, uh, Don Kalish. And I said, sure, I'll do that, naively. But I did it. And uh, soon was joined by other people, such as Bob Zaw, Sarah Woodsmith. And, um, uh, in doing that, everything changed for me. Everything in my life changed forever. And uh, one of the things that I remember very uh, early on was something that David said, which he would go out and he would do these stump speeches. And LA Resistance, as I'm sure other offices uh, uh, in California did with David, is we would set up gigs for him, as we would call it. And uh, all over LA, then all over Southern California, and then even in the Southwest United States. And um, so I heard innumerable speeches by David Harris and uh, to large and small audiences. And he would often say this he would quote Lao Tzu, a particular quote that inform, has informed me for my whole life because I have been an activist and continue to organize. And it was, the way to do is to be. The way to do is to be. And I took it to heart. The first time I heard it, it put me off my heels. And I took it in, 
And um, I think it's been one of the greatest lessons as an activist and an organizer <clears throat> that if you approach um, organizing with that in mind, it, what it tells you is that um, it's a way of approaching your work, that you have to be authentic, that you have to be careful because you don't just take on any issue, you only take on essential issues, and then you give it your utmost. And you're real, and you're transparent, and you're sincere with everybody that you come across. And just as we saw in this film, that you don't um, make people that may seem or actually be in fierce opposition the enemy, you only see them as opponents now and possibly allies in the future. You only see them as possible partners of yours in the future, as people that you hope to influence now and bring them into your circle. And if they, in fact, remain opponents, maybe somewhere down the line on another issue, they become allies on the next issue you deal with. Now, that's perhaps a wee bit idealistic on some of the really big issues on this planet, I know. But really, on most issues that many of us, because I know I'm probably talking to some activists, but I'm also sure. hoping that out there, there may be some younger people or even older people listening that are coming into activism and are listening about, how can I do this better? And just don't ever, ever alienate or make anyone your enemy. They're always potential allies. And that is a big lesson I learned. And I learned that from David Harris, that the way to do is to be. And to make no one a permanent enemy, don't hold grudges. And I, that's, I wanted to just say that right up front. Um, uh, do we, should, how long should we, I don't want to over talk here, as long as I care to. Okay, I hope everybody brought their sleeping bags. Uh, I'll just say a couple other things. I, I will, and then I'm, I wanted to clarify, you heard me singing uh, in that film. Uh, I wanted to put that in a little more context. Uh, that was I was, that singing became out came out of the sit-in all night sit-in at the Pentagon, March twenty first, nineteen sixty seven, March against the war in Washington D.C. at the end of Stop the Draft Week. Draft, Stop the Draft Week. You saw it started out with the first national draft card turning in the United States. That march on Washington against the war was the largest demonstration against the war to date. It was hundreds of thousands of people in Washington, D.C. Uh, that night at the Pentagon, I made my way there by myself and sat in there. It's a famous photograph of people putting daisies down the rifles. All of those daisies, those white daisies, that's what that was. There were just thousands and thousands of National Guardsmen with those, uh, with uh, rifles and a lot of bayonets. And it was a frightening scene. But uh, many of them deserted that night. Um, and uh, singing to them, s snapping out of the fear and into a whole different paradigm. Uh, just relaxed, de-escalated, and uh, changed it up for a lot. And that kind of thing was going on in a lot of different places that night. I want to hold up a book. Norman Mailer, the novelist, the American novelist, won a Pulitzer Prize for writing this book about that night. It's called The Armies of the Night, a Pulitzer Prize about that Pentagon sit-in. So I just wanted to highlight that. I have more to say, but I would I don't want to hog the mic for now. Maybe we can do a second round. Okay. So I was a draft resistor. I did most of the printing for Peace Press. I used to go to the induction of the 
the uh, federal building and pick up the indictment lists every Wednesday to show who, what kind of tri crimes are being indicted, and 35% were people refusing induction. It's the proof that nobody was showing up for this war anymore. I have them right here, if you want to look at them later. Um, I was uh, tried in front of Judge Pragerson, and uh, he, let, he let me defend myself. He tried to talk me out of it. I, uh, I was convicted of one count of refusing to take a, f a physical, and uh, he sends me to work in the national interest, and I refuse. I, once I took a position of non-cooperation, I never cooperated again. I went from not applying for 2S because I wanted to think about the war, and I have all these letters. To, and w then I finally turn in my draft card, and that's a felony. And that's that line. When you step over that line, it's a different world for you. Mm -hmm. And that's where social change happens, is when you step over that line. And for people that weren't qualified for the draft, uh, men that were over age and all women, we suggested that they find ways to uh, join the, the fray. And what people did was they would sign statements of complicity. They would put ads in the LA Times. We stand with them. We urge them to take this action. That's conspiracy. You know, if you you and I jaywalk across the street, that's, that's, that's a misdemeanor. But if we discuss it in advance and we plan it out, that's a conspiracy. That's breathing together. That's what the government is really afraid of. And the resistance breathes together. And we, we're still breathing. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we do because we've been buried in history. Uh, as we were finishing up this film, I was just an executive producer or something, raising money. Uh, Ken Burns came out with his 18-hour documentary on Vietnam. I thought, wow, finally our story gets told. I watched 18 hours. There wasn't one word about the resistance in there. I thought I'd fallen asleep, so I watched it all again, all 18 hours. <laughs> it's not there. I immediately called Loyola Marymount and said, I want to talk to your students. And I'm not a public speaker. And I, she said, well, there's only a few, might be five. I don't care if there's one. I want to start this. And so I would go in there and I would speak as Joe Ordinary, how ordinary people can affect social change. Because when Martin Luther King gets up on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, it's important that there's people like me behind him. And when David Harris says, let's stop cooperating with the draft, it's important that our people are behind him. So I went to Loyola Marymount and, you know, I've spoken there 12 times and shown this film 12 times. And the first question I ask is, how many people are aware of this war? There's never been more than two people that raise their hand. Usually one, never more than two. That's important because if they don't know about the war, they certainly don't know about the draft resistance, and they don't know that we ended the draft. Does that affect their lives? Yes, it does, because they don't have to worry about the foreign policy or a 2S, because they're not going to be put on a plane to Afghanistan or, or wherever. It's important. And they could use what we did, which was pulling ourselves, as David Harris said, um, evil is a participatory phenomenon, and your first option is to to pull yourself out of it, stop cooperating. So it meant no CO, even though I flunked a physical, I'm not gonna take one again, I'm gonna refuse. Pull yourself out of it. And we, we now have to come back and fight for our place in history because we deserve to be heard in history. And, and the youth of today, they face many more things than we do. There's food insecurity on most campuses goes on and on. Uh, adjunct professors, professors aren't getting paid. So they could use a look at our tactic. They may not use it. They may come up with something different. But we have to fight for our place in history. That's what I'm doing. That's what I intend to continue to do. Because you know, now that David Harris is gone, I want to carry on his words and what he did. And he spoke about, we all have a cons we all have a constituency, people who watch what we do. And you see it in this film. You see Daniel Ellsberg 
go to visit Randy Keeler. And out of that, he decides to release the Pentagon Papers. And those of us who've kept up our political actions, we can see in our own lives where we've had an effect on other people that have become willing to do what, what we did. You know, people have asked me to please drive me to the Nevada test site and I, we'll get arrested together. So I have a list of those people. I can see that it's true. And he said it way back then. We've been passing out this uh, little newspaper. And basically that is the film on paper. And on the back page, it's got all of the, the things that David Harris learned that he wanted to pass on. If you stick to those six or seven things he has down there, you can't go wrong. You keep your integrity, people will watch what you do, and we can perhaps have some social change. Well, first of all, I want to thank the Resource Center for Nonviolence for having this. And I guess what I'm really struck by, um, if everyone asked, how do we end up in this room today? You know, you ask people their journeys, and I think it's interesting that um, a little bit more grayer and still here. Uh, I'd like to just share a little bit about um, how a lot of times movements work. So I'm, I'm Mandy Carter. My first 18 years, I was awarded the state of New York, born November 2nd, 1948. A mother had me, my brother Ronnie, and sister Dolores. She left and never came back. So I was raised in the Albany Children's Home, Schenectady Children's Home, and a foster family. I think if we went around the room right now and asked, how do we end up in this room? But also, why do we end up doing what we've done in this particular war, this particular thing we believe in? So I just wanna share it more of a story, if I could, and then get into some um, stuff. Uh, I, have, I also bought some memorabilia. I'm a pack rat. Uh, for those of us born, 1948, post-World War II baby boomers, can I just ask a quick show of hands how many people were born between 1946 and 64? All right. Anyone between the ages of 18 and 40, could you raise your hands? Well, we might have a conversation about this because those 18 to 40 year olds now outnumber us. And so no shade, but if we're gonna have conversation, we might wanna think about who they are, where they are, and how we go ahead with this conversation. I've really been struck by how I ended up as one of the many thousands upon thousands of people, too young for Dr. King. When that, when that speech happened in 1963, was I 14? But Dr. King on April 4th, 1967, talked about that war in Vietnam at the Riverside Church, but he talked about economic and social justice. That's the Poor People's Campaign. And so for him to make the connection between the war in Vietnam and ask the question, how can you send thousands upon thousands of black folk, men, to another country of color and kill and kill in the name of democracy and didn't have it when you came back? But that question is still posed now in terms of the have and have nots. Have and have nots economically, where we live, I live in Durham, North Carolina, very rural. But my awakening came because of social studies teachers. Anyone here a social studies teacher? Thank you. Because when I was a junior in high school, you might be able to relate to this, someone, my social studies teacher brought someone in from a group called the American Friends Service Committee, never heard of it. But three things that said that day is why I'm here now, and why you're here, Winter, and why you're here, Bob, and those of us who are still here and knows not born yet, but should. It was a white guy, no, you know, no disrespect, but he said, the American Friends Service Committee really believes in the principle of full equality and justice for all. The second thing he said is about the power of one. I didn't get that, but then he said, we have a high school work camp in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania who would like to go. I raised my hand. That's why I'm sitting here right now, but not just me. That's a generation. So we get to the high school work camp up in the Pocono Mountains, and you know, it's like we're eating carrots and you know, brown rice and whatever. Now I eat that all the time. But they bought in a white folk singing couple from the Highlander Center, Guy and, Car Guy and Candy Carowin. They called themselves culture worker. I never heard that before. I heard about Joan Baez and Bob Dylan. And then they said, this is what we're gonna do. We as white allies wanna go down south 
And we want to record the freedom songs in those meetings in those black churches because this is a way maybe perhaps we can be allies in that movement. Those clips are now sitting at the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, DC. But the thing that I was so struck by is that how do people who are not black, who are not particularly you know, engaged, but they ask the simple question and all of us get to do the same thing, the power of one, what can I do? How can I remove my particular complicity? But then how do I maximize it? How do I organize it? I was really struck by that. And one of the groups they recorded were the Freedom Singers. Bernice Johnson Reagan went on to form Sweet Honey in the Rock. Music, and you're thinking about it. I'll end with this and then we'll do more yakking, but I think I've really been struck, and I just wonder about this. How, how does someone touch your life? What is it? I'm looking at Gail Zermanio and Martine Habib. We were at the Institute at the very last session in Carmel Valley in that original building, and we are still here. Michelle, knowing about Christopher Colorado Jones, people we've known, people who have touched us, but they might not be here anymore, but what they believed in, what we get to carry on with our children, grandchildren, but also how many of the Vietnamese, how many other people had to, had to be murdered. It took me 20 years to go look at that wall. 20, I couldn't do it. 20 years, and that wall is still there, but it wasn't just the Americans who died. You know that. Sons and daughters and the images of what we saw but it wasn't just that particular war. The War Resisters League is celebrating its 100th year this year. And the founding principle was this, believing all wars, international or civil, I strive to remove my individual complicity, but try to move the causes and purpose of war. I knew no one. I had just checked out to California, San Francisco, went to the Haight-Ashbury switchboard, and if anyone did that back in the day, they pulled a Rolodex card. The Rolodex card they pulled was Vincent O'Connor of the Catholic Peace Fellowship. And that's where I got to stay. And Vincent O'Connor was invited down to the Institute for the Study of Nonviolence, where they were organizing that nonviolent civil disobedience action in October. I didn't do it in October, I went in December. <clears throat> Principles and values, what you believe in. And with all due respect, jail, no bail. Because that's who else is sitting in there as well. So after I went, a woman named Jane Shulman said, hi, my name is Joan Shulman. I'm with the War Resisters League. Would you like to come to a potluck? I went to that potluck, and I joined WRL in 1969. Here's the calendar. And just for the heck of it, I wanted to open it up. What's today? March, 7th, March 11th? So on March the 11th, I'll tell you exactly what I was doing. Bear with me, Christopher is part of this as well. Ah, here it is. We had a thing called the Light and Sound Show. It was nothing more than slides and, you know, all about the war in Vietnam. So on March 11th, we were taking this slideshow around to different places in San Francisco. We were at the, can I even read this? There was a weekly, oh, in Pacifica, we did a Light and Sound Show. We also did a dress and rehearsal for and we got arrested. We had a, an extra charge of loud and tumultuous noise. That was the WRL Jug Band. So we got five extra days. We were doing a rehearsal. We keep it. Winter has stuff. Bob has stuff. We all need to remember the importance of hanging on to stuff. But this is like 54 years ago. And I want to know who's sitting here now with your children or your grandchildren. Oh, my gosh. And here you are. And you are? Your name? Okay. And you are? Right? And why are you here? Yep. And the year was 59, 69. Yes. Right? And I'm looking behind you, Gail, and other folks on there as well, and Sarah. All I can say, and, I'll, and we'll stop, I'll say, but power of one. Realizing every day we get up and go about our daily lives, we never have any idea of whose lives we might impact or not. So it's not a question of if I can realize it. The question is, do we just do it because it's the right thing to do? And so, all these years later, we are still here. I am still queer. Um, we are still figuring out how this thing works out for, for, for nonviolence. I have to say, I'm really, I, I have to, I just, I'm just trying to figure, I have more questions than I do answers right now, but the fact that we're even trying to figure this out a little bit is really empowering to me. And I can't say enough about faith-based organizing as well, the importance of that. And you are all here as well. Peter and the rest of the crew, I'll stop. Oh, and one more thing. <laughs> Sorry. No, go right ahead. Right. No, no. 
Um, the War Resistance League turns 100 years old. And here's the 95th, see that calendar, that poster? Well, we have 100. Anyone who's a graphic designer might want to figure out what the 100th anniversary of WRL would be open for proposals. Thank you. We're going to have a question and an answer in a little bit. Um, and we'll, we'll do another little go round here. Um, I'm sure you have some more comments. Yeah. Go right ahead. I want to I, I want to say something to encourage people to do this. At first, I want to say I want to put it in context, and then I want to encourage everybody that can hear me to do this. And it kind of saves way on something that you said. Um, LA Resistance is the only resistance office that I know of, and I've I've checked around. We're the only office in the United States, there were many resistance offices that have established a formal archive as an office. It's established in Los Angeles at the LA Central Library, the historic Central Library. It's one of the best things, Bob and I were involved in, in doing it all of the, our resistances, re, resistors have donated material to it. Filmmakers have donated their films on resistance to it. Authors have donated to it. Supporters donated to it. Clergy from the migrant ministry that supported us have donated to it. It's a huge range of materials. It is open to the public, to researchers, who have made use to uh, 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 made use of it? Uh, it's in the special collections. There has been an exhibit uh, based on the materials. There have been two events uh, at the library, um, and there was just a screening of our film there uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, it is an it, it's just an incredible opportunity to keep. Um, this sort of information, but also the notion of resistance. And just as Mandy said, the power of the individual and then the power, as we saw from the film, of those individuals bonding together and what that can do in the face of immense opposition, the power of the US government and their military. So here's what I am putting out to everybody that can hear my voice. An archive is a precious and incredibly valuable thing. If there was a resistance office in Santa Cruz, think about establishing an archive, perhaps at the university or an in another institution. It is a project. You have to approach them. You have to deal with them. You have to negotiate them with them, and then you have to have, ask people for materials. It's a different sort of proposition than an individual donation, although that's good. If you have papers, if you have things to donate, then think about where those items are going to go. Or are they going to go into the trash when your grandkids go through your stuff and they don't understand the value? So there's my pitch. Establish an archive. Talk to your friends that were in um, important initiatives that you took together and think about putting it together and doing establishing an archive. And um, I think that's what I have to say. Question, can you repeat? Can you repeat sorry about no crossing here. Um, can you repeat the name of the city and the name of the... Um... It's the Los Angeles Resistance Archive or Collection at the Los Angeles County Library Central Branch. 
This is the Downtine Branch. It's a very uh, famous uh, central library. So it's a central library of the Los Angeles County Library. I mean, Los Angeles, yeah, Los Angeles Library. If you just go online and Google it, you can get right there. And there, for an archive, there's a thing called the Finders Aid, uh, the Finders Aid and you can actually find uh, an outline of the kinds of things that are in the collection. And then you can go visit it if you want to and actually see the kinds of materials. And it's really an interesting collection and it includes things, actually some things from Palo Alto Resistance. And I don't know if it has things from Santa Cruz, I don't think so, but certainly Northern California Resistance is in there and some WRL material and Institute for the Study of Nonviolence. There's things in there, but mostly Los Angeles Resistance. I just wanted to make real quick another observation. Um, when I had talked about the idea when that draft was happening, and people remember, every night during the dinner hour, they would do the body count, right? Yes. And then as you saw as the years went by, they tried to figure out, well, let's not do that, we'll do something else. The thing I've been most distressed about as a person of color, and also you've got a lot of women and a lot of people going, and they're not having a draft, there's an economic conscription going on right now. So if you think about how do I get a job, how am I gonna get an education, where do I have to figure out, but if that means you have to kill or be killed in the name of that, that needs to be questioned. But I really have been struck now, though, you have peace studies now, you've got black studies, you have women's studies, all the different kind of cultural, kind of like um, how we keep on moving forward in terms of the work we do. And Bob, like Bob, we were talking earlier, how, many stuff did, how much stuff did you throw away, Bob? And you're thinking, why did I, get, why did I throw that away? I've lost it. But the good thing is, this is a perfect example. I threw a lot of stuff away, but people like Steve Ladd and some others, they kept copies of everything. You can digitize now. I would like to know how do we how do we maintain memories before us before us before us a lot of that is now oral history where people are sitting down and actually talking to another person or keeping track not only in english i would like to know how people would look at that war in vietnam from all different perspectives for those who had to fight it those who and by the way i'm going to just say this up front jesse helms north carolina didn't serve one day in the military, but thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people were sent over to that war. And so when we talk about acts of individual resistance, individual we can do on our own, but also collectively. But how do we make the people accountable? I would hate to think that I have to get a degree and who do I have to kill or be killed to get that? That makes no sense to me. And so the economic justice organizing, the poor people campaign still exists to this day. So I would like to put us out of a job. I don't know about y'all, but I'd like to put myself out of a job if that's at all possible. I have some other things I, I, I have better to do. But until such time, these kinds of conversations and where we have, how, how we talk, where we're gonna talk. What was the name of your son when your son was born? Oak. Oak. And Oak has many, how many more children now? He has four. And they're all named what? <laughs> no shade. <laughs> Julia, Jack. Samuel. Yeah, I knew a woman named Sunshine. She's now Dr. Sutherland. I mean, just things happen. I love it. So, all right, Bob, go. And then you. So I want to make a couple other points. Uh, moving on from the point of, uh, what was it, one thing at a time? Yes. Yeah, that's an important point that, that I work with at, at LMU. You know, the students um, are now required to send me their thoughts of what they know about Vietnam and they don't know anything. So I know what people know about Vietnam, and that's nothing. And I've already said why it's important that we, we establish our history so that that can be passed on and not left in the dust, that we carry on the words of David Harris. But I also talked to them about one thing at a time. I said, you know, Cesar Chavez was one living room at a time, and look what he created. Greta, Thunberg, you know, she's sitting on the side of the road with a poster. Now look at her. I'm going to show him a picture next week. It's a building under construction on Lincoln Boulevard for a safe place for youth. I'm going to call it one sandwich at a time. 
because my friend went down to the boardwalk 15 years ago and started handing out sandwiches to teenagers, homeless youth, people that have turned out of foster care and, you know, what, you know where you, foster care, basically. And they have no safety net. They have nothing. And she turned that into the biggest social agency for homeless youth in L.A. County. And now there's this four-story building being built on Lincoln, which will house a bunch of kids. She's already got several other places around the county, and people, people are relying on her. So I point out to the students that a lot of you are going to, you're not going to follow your degree, but you can get passionate about something, and you can create something, and here's these examples around you. And one of the things that I point out to them, I said, look, Back in 1969 or whatever, Stonewall in New York, that's when the word, the letters L and G became part of the lexicon in this country. And then quickly or over the period of the next 20 years, L, G, B, Q, T, I, A, plus two S, <laughs> two souls. So the, all those letters are out there. And so what this means to me, I'm not a history teacher, but Here's what I think. This is the first time that every iteration of human sexuality has stepped up to demand their rights to life. And it's our job, and it's these students' job at LMU or wherever to support that. That's a project they can do. I can tell them some ways to do it, too. But that's something we all need to do because transgender people are getting killed behind this. So that's one of the places we have to stand up and I'm trying to show them that if they have a passion, that can turn into their the rest of their life. I'm not making money off being a peace activist, but I've had the best life I could imagine. And one of the best things that happened was when we put this, Winter and I were the main organizers of the archives, and we got it to the LA Public Library. They let us do a show. And up on the side of the library, one of the many places in LA that was pro-war is a sign that was two stories high, <clears throat> said, we won't go. And 14,400 people showed up at our exhibit. And the most important thing to come out of it was not suggested by us, it was suggested by the librarian. Let's do a newspaper as your handout. And that is this film on paper. So please get a copy uh, when you leave. It's really important. Thank you, Bob. We will have a Q&A, just a couple announcements in the, the interim here. Um, just a comment on the archive thing. I think if folks have things they want to preserve and um, have last into the future, uh, I'll just put Resource Center for Nonviolence. We, we'll, we'll take them off your hands. We've got a bunch of stuff uh, in the attic um, that and I've got a bunch of stuff in my garage <laughs> from various people over the years. Um, that's always been on my to-do list. So if you want a central gathering place for stuff that you uh, want to donate, please see me afterwards. Um, so if you notice at the end of the film, I saw some applause. Uh, the Resource Center for Nonviolence had a little logo in there. So we played a, 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 a small but significant role in uh, getting the film made. And, not insignificant, actually. Uh, we were the fiscal sponsor for the film, so all the monies came through us. We managed the flow of the money. And uh, it was interesting, a lot of moving parts to keep in play there. And uh, it's, it's kind of bringing that you know, back full circle in a way. It's like, you know, I never, I've never met any of these panelists before tonight, but it's like, you know, they're the reason I'm here now. You know, it really, it really is. It's, people I've never met who did the work in the trenches, you know, back in the day and are still in the trenches doing it. That's why I'm here. And that's, that's why this center is here. That's why I think I'm here, <laughs> really, when you, when you look at it. Um, just in terms of acknowledging, uh, uh, to my mind, who played the, the biggest role in, in, in our piece of the film um, was, uh, uh, he's on our board of directors. His name is Tom Hellman. You still here, Tom? There he is. Give Tom a round of applause. He kind of really, without him shepherding all this through, that really, it, it, it would have been a lot messier to bring this thing to fruition, really. 
um, just being involved peripherally in it as it, as it made its way through. Um, I want to put out, um, I've got a clipboard under here, and I'll, I'll leave it on the piano. Oh, oh, did you pull it out? No, this is my clipboard, not your clipboard. Um, the Resource Center for Nonviolence it has, it has a, a significant history that goes way back. At, at some point, it was a, a hub for like the Central Committee for Conscientious Objectors. They did draft counseling and things like that. When I came along, there wasn't much of that happening. The way I got involved in this center was around the anti-military stuff. I would say, so the program now is more through a bunch of different uh, iterations that you now we're considering it's all under the rubric of opposing militarism. So I just want to invite folks who are interested in doing any aspect of that kind of work, um, what we did in the past and would like to do again, uh, and what I personally did, what, we were a hub for the GI rights hotline. There's a GI rights network to, we counsel uh, active duty people in the military and how to get out if they're a deserter, what they need to do to clear their status. If they're AWOL, what they're facing, you know, where do they go to turn themselves in? They need lawyers for different things. Well, we can hook them up. Uh, the National Lawyers Guild has a, has a, has a, a program for that. Um, there's also the, the other component of that is uh, counter-recruitment, sometimes known as truth in recruitment, being able to go into the schools and, and counter uh, recruiters, what we consider misinformation in terms of like trying to get people to sign up. So the, 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 the battle, I guess, the struggle is the way I see it, is like <clears throat> I was, I consider myself a resistor in some ways, but I really didn't put my body on the line to, to some extent. It's, it's, I was a, a draft registration resistor. Right, so I said, "Hey, you turned 18, you got to register." I'm like, hey, you know, f off. You know, and you know, what is more of that power of one thing? So I was thinking it was more like, you know, just a selfish <laughs> sob, really. You're not going to tell me what to do. You know, it's a, more of the like privileged white male kind of thing. You know, Orange County. This is like Republican territory. I was like, nah, government's not going to tell me what to do. And and so, okay, get the threatening letters in the mail. Okay, go to jail. You know, pay the fine. You know, it's like. I'll put that aside, you know, a year later it comes to the next one, threatening one. Ten years in jail, $250,000. F off. You guys aren't going to do anything. The only people they were going after at that time, and, you know, just having a political consciousness kind of fairly early on, the only people they were going out after were the people that were speaking out. So, and they basically got one guy down there who was like, you know, he was on the steps of the... <laughs> Yeah, you know, the, the government building there saying, like, eh, you know, I'm not going to do it. Um, but in terms of, like, consequences, the consequences were, and to this day, it's pretty much the same. You're not going to be able to qualify for federal student aid. Um, so that is off your plate. So, okay. Um, the, the other thing is you'll never get a civil service job. You can't join the, the Foreign Service or Diplomatic Corps or any of that. You're automatically excluded from that. And in some states, not in California, you can't get a driver's license. That's the prerequisite for if you don't register for the job. So again, this is all kind of stuff in terms of like, you know, get out there and give accurate information to the public. Um, but the battle is, and these just, came out, and I don't want to go on and on about this, but these are two recent things in the Sentinel, you know, just the headlines. Army boss's mission persuades schools to welcome recruiters. They're in a recruiting crisis. They, they're, they've missed their goals, they're way down, you read any of the news. And so it's kind of time, like if they're gonna try to get back into schools, it's time for us to be back in the schools, right? And uh, right along with that, Two days later, sexual assault reports increase at U.S. military academies. It's up a good 12% in, in all the services. So there's good reasons to be out there and basically say no to the military in all aspects. So any interest in GI rights stuff, counseling active duty military, wanting to go into schools, counter recruiters in any fashion. The all, also other piece of that, there's Peter over there. <laughs> So, okay, I guess he has the official clipboard, sorry. Um, also, uh, a few years ago, we did some work. Uh, we called it the Weapons Inspection Team. Lockheed Martin is about 12 miles up the hill in Empire Grade. Uh, we tried to figure out what they were doing. We weren't getting much cooperation. The environmental compliance with the county was basically rubber stamping everything they submitted and never, like, set foot on the property. 
Uh, we've heard rumors from everything from nuclear triggers for Trident submarines to, you know, you know, basically pools of heavy metal um, contamination all over up there. Um, what we need is a whistleblower to come out of there. So you know, who works up there. You want to do work on that and forcing our uh, county officers to get up there and actually investigate them. That's another piece of it because uh, if there's no money in war, I think that's that's half of it, you know. If there's no profits in it, it still keeps pushing it. So it's kind of like that's what I see is the three three things. If you're interested, see Peter on that. All right, thank you for indulging me on that. That's amazing. Um, Peter, you want to come up and announce some... Some things. Oh, can, while Peter's doing that, I want to just say, sure. go back to the, um, uh, Bob, when you're saying, you know, like, you know, now we have um, gender pronouns. She, her, hers. He, his, him. They, their, thems. We just say y'all means y'all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. Y'all means y'all. <laughs> just, just a kind of friendly way to say. But I, we were just having a question, and maybe I'll pose it to you as well. We're sitting here yakking about can anyone even begin to relate to what was that, not just this one war, I mean, before that you had other World War II, but how can anyone even begin to comprehend or have a sense of what it means to be in war, or how does one remove their individual complicity? I thought one of the most interesting things, because you know there's a statement, don't mourn, or don't mourn, if there's a need, fill it. There's a lot of us who were never gonna serve one day in that military, women, people older, but then there was the thing called a call to resist. You might remember this. A call to resist is when the call went out and people said, if anyone is called aiding and abetting, you get five years or 10,000, 10, whatever. But the biggest mistake they made, they went after Benjamin Spock. That book is in every household in America. And so I think they miscalculated again, but I thought it really made it a point about I might not be king, I can't be, you know, whatever, but I know, as, just as me, as one person, I can remove my particular complicity, however that might be defined. That changes the whole dynamic, at least feeling like there's something I can do. And so I remember that was women, people stepping up, but that can happen to this day as well. How do you say no? And you just made a good point. Now that you're figuring out some other way, how much can we give you? You know, we'll give you this, we'll give you that, because the numbers are not there. Well, then if the numbers are not there, then who are they going to go after who's going to be much more susceptible? Much more, I need this. This is the difference between my family eating or not, and that the way I have to take care of that is going into the military. You can totally understand. So I think there's got to be some way to have a conversation. Who gets to have that conversation in what language, in what culture, and where that might be? So this opportunity is like just sitting here, it's not over yet. That machine continues to roll. It continues to roll. Continues to roll, and then all of us who are still alive to have this conversation get to figure out how I can be a part of that in terms of moving forward. So that's it. Anything else? Peter. Anything else you want to share? So this this center. Yep. It's on. Oh, is it on? Now? Yes, it is. Uh, most of you are connected already, but we and we um, are really trying to encourage and educate and train for the resistance that we need to do in the future. And one uh, coming up on April 4th, we, with other organizations, we do uh, a community reading of Dr. King's Beyond Vietnam speech that links militarism poverty, economic exploitation. I think he wasn't quite brave enough to say capitalism uh, and um, racism and patriarchy. Uh, so that's a, an opportunity to come and be part of that community reading. And then um, we're starting a series called Stories of Resistance, where we're asking local people who've been involved, been involved in resistance actions of all kinds to tell their stories and, and to learn and, and tell what they've learned from it. So the first one is going to be on the local Black Lives Matter movement with Joy Flynn and Bella Bonner. And then the second one is on the YAR um, rapid response, allied rapid response to uh, immigrants who've been under threat from ICE. And then we have 
you know, we easily found 50 different struggles just in Santa Cruz County that people can come and tell their stories and we can learn from. And, and uh, gratefully, um, we're part of uh, just more and more you know, community connections. Um, we have Santa Cruz Black that meets here um, and the executive director is, is here, Cheryl Williams. And uh, other, um, the NAACP and others that we are in partnership to you know, all of us want to reach out uh, and engage with others in our community of different communities and multi-generational. Um, so that's, uh, uh, I, I invite you. I also just wanted to just, just uh, remembering both our ancestors. Um, one of the people who is here today who is greeting you at the table, Steve Baer, is a member of Veterans for Peace. And, and he actually, he had a, a fairly hard time watching this film. Uh, and uh, I'll talk with him some more, but just to remember um, the veterans, who, uh, many of whom it wasn't their choice to be there either. Great. Thank you. Oh, 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 oh. Excuse me, bring up Robert. Yeah, might as well. And one more good announcement. Robert Levering, who's been a strong supporter of The Boys Who Said No, and is going to talk about something very related. Right. Uh, yeah, I brought a flyer about a film that, I'm, that I've helped to produce called The Movement and the Madman. And it's going to be on uh, PBS uh, all 330 local stations uh, on, and the premiere is on uh, just, I guess, over two weeks from now, March 28th, 9 p.m. throughout the country. Anyway, um, it's directly related to this other film, and I'll just tell you a quick backstory. Um, I was one of the, I think there were five of us, draft resistors who were the ones who actually uh, helped, well, I worked with Christopher, well, and also Sarah, and uh, Steve Ladd, Lee Swenson, Bob Cooney, anyway, and Bill Prince, and we uh, were advisors to uh, Judith Ehrlich, who's the director. Anyway, so, and we uh, made it difficult, made her life difficult. But anyway, the film did get done, and sort of when it was concluding, one of the things, uh, particularly Steve Ladd and I, felt that there really ought to be a film about the broad, broader peace movement. And this is an absolutely great film. You know, I'm very proud to have been part of it. Um, but it's about the draft resistance movement. And then there's a really good film called Sir No Sir that many of you may have seen or may not have seen, but that's a great, film about the GI resistance. But there's no film about the overall uh, anti-war movement. And so that was sort of like the thing I really wanted to do. And it just so happened that right about the time I was really thinking about that, uh, as Bob, Bob mentioned, you know, that Ken Burns series came out on PBS. And even though the draft resistance movement is not mentioned, but the overall movement is mentioned a couple of times and actually almost always in a disparaging way. Mm -hmm. Awful, yes. Awful. <laughs> Awful, yes. And so that was one of the things that really, you know, that there really ought to be a film that actually tells our story before we're all gone. <laughs> and that was really the impetus and um, a person who had the big impact on what part, I mean, how can you tell a story in a film unless you have Bank of America behind you, which Ken Burns does, uh, how can you tell a story about that overall movement? And Daniel Ellsberg had been mentioning, you know, and I heard him say a number of times about how in 1969, the uh, moratorium and the mobilization demonstrations in the fall of 1969 actually prevented uh, the possibility of nuclear war. And frankly, I thought that was pretty 
you know, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. But anyway, I did a whole lot of research. And in fact, there was, I mean, there have been a number of things that have been declassified in the last uh, 10, 15 years that show that that's true. But even more, and it's actually alluded to a couple of times in this film, that there was a, you know, an effort, or that Nixon and Kissinger had an idea of doing a um, major escalation of the war, bombing the dikes and so on. And it turns out that those demonstrations actually averted that. Anyway, so that is what our story is, you know, and so our story is about that, you know, 1969. And the theme of it is sort of like, the theme is very explicitly, even though you don't know, and you may not know in your lifetime, or you may, may take decades to find out what impact you're having, do it anyway because you are having an impact. Anyway, so watch the film. <laughs> yeah, I'll just say one other thing. It's going to be streaming. It's going to be available after the premiere, so it's not a one-night wonder. And it's, it's going to be available. And I highly encourage you to, uh, especially if you have kids, grandkids, or you know, uh, other people, to... Uh, have them watch it, because that's, that's how we are going to tell our story to other generations. Anyway, that's it. Thank you, Robert. Uh, may, I, may I say something really quickly? Please. I want to just reinforce that, and, and, what, and maybe this is obvious and I don't need to say a word. The, the point of this, whether it's this resistance film, what Bob has been saying, what you just said with the, the upcoming film, and thank you so much for that, the point of this isn't a bunch of old people wanting to tell the young people, oh, this is what I did in the war, honey. This is in vitally important. There has been an organized suppression of the truth of wh what was done to stop this war, to, to, de to uh, stop the escalation, and I believe to stop this war so that people don't know that people can band together to take extraordinary actions individually and together to stop this enormous war machine in this case. And it, this cannot be lost to history. These revisionists cannot succeed. And this, the upcoming film is important. This film is important. And we cannot, uh, there was extraordinary links they went through through the COINTELPRO program, the counterintelligence program, the FBI and, and other secret services that went after people, murdered people. I have a seven, this is 5,000 pages of an FBI file on the resistance and myself, all illegal. They did this to person after person, 24 hour surveillance on the resistance and many other people. It's vital, these films and this history, that it stay alive, not as an ego trip, but because people have to know they can have the power to uh, counter uh, what may come up or is uh, facing them. And I just wanted to reinforce that. Movies, the movie that was mentioned was Sir No Sir. Uh, excellent recommendation. That is the organized opposition from within the military and from the veterans. It's a great movie. It's the Winter Soldier investigations. It shows them when they were throwing their medals back at the Capitol, things like that. Are they organized resistant to refuse orders even while in the field in Vietnam? Highly recommended. And one that kept popping into my head here listening to all this was it was an influential uh, film at the time, I believe, called Hearts and Minds. Yes, won the Academy Award. Yeah. Who did that? Hearts and I'm forgetting it at the moment, but I got, the, uh, I got hold of the DVD. Yeah. I watched it, and I said, there's got to be more to this story. I went back and watched it with the director's commentary on. This is like 25 years later. 
blow your mind in terms of like they're looking at Kissinger and you know the, all the people involved in the peace talks, you know, in Vietnam and stuff. And then the benefit of twenty, you know, hindsight, twenty five years later, it was just amazing. So you mentioned like you know how close we were to nuclear confrontation. There's absolutely right what you found out. But uh, t watch the movie Hearts and Minds. Watch it again with the director's commentary turned on. It's just, it's a completely different movie with that benefit. Uh, I want to now open it up to uh, audience uh, questions and I'll, yeah, concerns, criticism. Way back, go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm really glad you have some time for question and answers. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank you all because in my little life, you people are my priests. You are my teachers. You have utterly and completely shaped my life. I was a little, as you can see, a little white girl in South Jersey. Used to follow Angela Davis's uh, the etching of her afro in the Courier Post. I was like, what's wow? You know, I used to follow the war day by day. I read the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Courier Post, Lifetime, Look, Newsweek, every day. And then all those guys, Ted Huntley, all that. And I just want you to know, you people made my life. I'm, I don't have a lot of money, uh, but I've had a wonderful life organizing. I was too young to protest in the Vietnam War. I lived in a suburb, but I got to be a lead organizer. I did a lot of grunty work in San Diego against the last Iraq War. And that was because of you all. That's why I did it. I've watched a lot of films, I've listened to tons of panels, and I'm just so glad you gave me the opportunity, because actually, it's very rare that I'm really with people who, I, I mean, I've met others like you over the years, but I have to tell you, and so, it means so much to me, this film, it means so much to me, I'm over 60 now, I'm actually taking a job at McDonald's, <laughs> which is horrifying to me. I'm, a, I'm an, uh, an environmental activist. I've been front lines for so many movements. And so to have to go to work at McDonald's, because I really need to make sure that I pay the rent. I'm lucky to be housed. I've been homeless uh, because I love organizing. I've been living in campaign cars. I'm telling you, you guys are awesome. You shaped my life. I can't believe that nobody knows about the Vietnam War, except for one thing. I live with some very belligerent young people who love Trump, who are completely unconscious of so many things, and they're pretty mean. Yeah, they've been bullying me for, for two years, and I live with a landlord also, it's kind of a Trump guy, but anyway, um, what I'm really trying to get to is, I want to thank you for listening to that, because with all my heart, it really means a lot to me to be able to thank you. Uh, your friends who have died, uh, you people act absolutely influenced my life. I've been an organizer, I started out in the health field when Reagan cut it. I had great supervisors who taught me how they got there. A hundred years of work, work, work to get those services in the state of Massachusetts, which was the best state. And so when it was all cut, I was right there and I was working my, uh, my Bosses were black women in Dorchester, Massachusetts. I had gone there because it was the best state, and now I'm working for homeless, and this is what I want to say. My question to you, we have something we've tried to start here on Wednesday nights, the Homeless Union. It's another couple of hours when homeless people can come in, and get some coffee, some bagels. Here. Bathroom's here, we just started it. I actually won't be able to be here this Wednesday because I have to go start my job at McDonald's. Um, but the reason I wanted to mention it is because this whole connection that I learned through Martin Luther King, through people like you, connecting the dots through Muhammad Ali, of war and the economic wars, especially on people of color, but also, you know, women and, and uh, LGBTQIA, these things are so connected, so incredibly connected. And question? so, if you would please speak a little more about, we, we are, we are ha having a horrid, horrid battle here for the lives of homeless people. Homeless people are just getting creamed. I personally started to read Ward Churchill because I think reading about genocide is absolutely essential to understanding how we are allowing our people 
to be out in this kind of weather that we've had for the last couple of atmospheric rivers, freezing outside. In this city is one of one of the richest cities in the whole world. We did a huge study here. Guys, sociologists of UCSD, no room at the inn. It's about the refusal for uh, how to build housing, especially for the poor and low-income people. So we've got a lot of the homeless grew up here. That's been substantiated by uh, official sociologists. I've been really doing research on this. So I'm just trying to say, anything you want to say about that, we're not confronting it here. We're not confronting it here enough. A few people like Keith McHenry maybe and some other people who are, are very good at, at working on this issue, I can't think yeah. too clearly right now. But uh, literally, okay. we, this is a, a war right here in Santa Cruz that we are tolerating. We white people, we wealthy people are tolerating the poor to be absolutely left outside. Many who have mental illness, but not all. Some are vets. I've met them. So I'm just asking that you please yeah. talk about that a little more. And, and I also want to say thank you also as well. I mean, it's a mutual Maybe going back and forth. Uh, I want to say also thank you too as well. I mean, we're talking about this reality. Can I, can, let's put something else in the conversation. Let's talk about class. I was just up in New York, uh, we're San Francisco. You know, you think about COVID, you go down one block and you see who's there and who's not there. You know, but I, 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 I want to, I guess whatever, whatever you were asking, this is in rel relation to the resource center or this particular building or this particular city. And Sarah, you're here, you want to, because I, I live in Durham, so I'm not sure. We have a homeless issue is there as well. But also, it's a question of like, you know, doors are open or not open. People be able to provide the medical services they, are, they, they can or cannot. I was looking at, we're talking about Dolores Huerta, farm workers, thinking about who's doing the labor. And I drove through all these hills up here. And so when you think about how age is a collective we, in terms of how we might address that, but in particular to Santa Cruz, maybe one of y'all want to respond to that. <laughs> you live here, right, in Santa Cruz? Yeah, right okay. But I want to say thank you, too, as well, for the stuff you've been doing. Yeah, well, I don't know specifically, I mean, the struggle is ongoing in all these, all these different areas. And as, as the presenter or the speaker mentioned, you know, we, Food Not Bombs uh, meets here, and we're, we're big supporters of Keith McHenry and, and that whole movement. And, uh, again, she's entirely right. You know, there is a... I mean, just recently, the police department and Food Not Bombs doesn't get along. They, they, so there needs to be pressure applied to them. Um, so that, again, that's a class issue, right? It's, it's poor versus, you know, those who want to keep the poor out of sight. Um, I want to open it back up to the panel, though, if you have any thoughts about what the, spe uh, what the audience member said. Any final thoughts? We'll, we'll go on then. We can talk afterwards if you want to get into the specifics of Santa Cruz, because, uh, yeah. Um, I, I'd like to know why this is the audience. It's like a reunion of those of us who already knew, know, were involved in the majority of this. Can everybody why, hear the question? Why yeah. okay. was nobody else aware of or interested in. I had a, a friend with a 15 year old grandson. She talked about it to him and he said, I want to go because the military has recruiters in my middle school. Oh, and I don't know anything about war or the military. And he wanted to come and continuously through this, he said, why do we know this? Why is it in school? This isn't in our textbooks. It's not in our library. Nobody talks about it. Why don't we know anything about it? And he basically is just your run-of-the-mill dumb device kit. He's not some He's not that. intelligent, super, you know, he's just a regular kid. And, and he's like, why don't they tell us that? They're telling us to join the military. We're in middle school. That's years away. So what, do you, what would be okay. some, some of your thoughts? What do you think? I don't know anything about uh, marketing programs. 
but it just seems like why did why did the word not come out? I mean, it's a really important film for people 20, 30, 40, 50 years younger than we are who really have had no exposure to it. How do you dispose of it? How do you? Oh, I mean, a lot of people watch the, the yeah. I, thank I you. On a PDF. <laughs> right. But, but just a general question for the, the the live viewing audience at home on this is is. Why are the demographics so skewed um, to where it's, you know, it's it's a it's a reunion? So, yeah. well, but wait. There you I go. Go a, ahead. I have a question. I, I I couldn't quite hear everything you had to say. But are you saying that you know somebody or you're related to somebody that's in middle school where recruiters are coming into their school? In Watsonville now, yeah. But you're related or know somebody? All right. Well, I mean, I my ears perk up. I mean, there are uh, I mm. so I relate to that immediately as a opportunity, possibly at least to f put out feelers to see if there's a possibility of organizing around that issue of military recruiters coming into a middle school, um, and it may be. F that there isn't, that there isn't uh, enough other parents that are concerned, but there might be. Uh, and I don't know that that's you, but you know uh, apparently the parents, I just see it as an opportunity of approaching it that way of what the hell are, why the hell are there military recruiters? I mean, I know why there are military recruiters in the middle school. I think that that's very obvious. They're grooming them for the high school. There's probably military recruiters in the high school too, because that's the age ultimately by 18 when they have to register, quote, have to register. And the other thing people need to know is that there have been active hearings in Washington, D.C. about women, young women, uh, uh, being required to register for, for uh, uh, register. So anyway, I'd just like to say that. Yeah, just as a response to that, I'd be say get in touch with me afterwards. If there's, we still have uh, an opportunity to have equal time in the schools. If we know recruiters are there, we know when. We can we can uh, ask uh, the school to let us in at the same time, and we can table across the quad from them. If they made a classroom presentation, then we get to go to that same class and counter that presentation in some way. So I think that's why you know, I put out the call earlier. If people want to do that kind of work, which we desperately need of, there's a turnover as, of administrators. And, you know, students obviously every four years, whatever, come and go. So there's a need that, that we could base it out of here and kind of like keep on. Tr keep that on track and um, keep they're on their heels I think it's a it's a good opportunity to keep them on their heels so um, in, the it, in the back please yeah and I happen to have the distinct honor of working with Gen Z oh. and so you really want to get the 15 year old you have to do a social media campaign. We have also another Gen Z who does our social media. Our social media is popping. People, we went from, I don't know how many, 135 to 1,000. Mm -hmm. That may seem like, oh, that doesn't mean that means people are listening. People are reading, they're seeing things, and we are doing things. So what you want to reach those, and I think it was Mandy, sorry to point, <laughs> you had said there is an economic mm -hmm. conscription going on. Now, I know about, obviously, I know about the Vietnam War. <laughs> and my son, who's also a millennial, knows about it because I'm the person that I am. And, but not all of us. I'm, I've been an activist all my life because I was plopped in the middle of a very active area. Um, so it was really hard not to. But you want to you get people, you have to have a really vigorous um, social media campaign. And it's not Facebook, because all these old folks are on Facebook. It's not Facebook, it's, in, it's Instagram, just so you know. And that's what's gonna get it. And, you have to, and it's gonna be meaningful, but it's gonna be graphic. 
and it's got to be short. And TikTok as well. Now I laughed, and but no, I listened to this young man. I was like, he knows what he's talking about. Thank you. you guys have a response to that? I'll take one more question. Yeah, Michelle. Do you have any response? I just wanted to piggyback on the Watson bill thing. And I, I don't know a lot about Watson, but I do know that um, it's predominantly for older families. Mm -hmm. And so if they're coming into the high school, my guess would be because some of these young folks, like we were talking about the military, may be a way for them to get college or citizenship. Yeah, or green cards or whatever. So I could see where, yeah, they would be coming in. And he would need someone to maybe spare speaking. Thank you for the yeah. Prime also, really important. Everything you know, we're, we're going to be serious about this English and whatever the other language. Not only not only English, and we're really being serious. And you might notice on a lot of our COVID or whether people are doing, oftentimes you'll see both ASL, English, Spanish, other like languages to make it much more accessible. So not, no one can be saying I don't know about it. Um, but my sister, I am with you. I have no idea. Snapchat, TikTok, not a clue. But on the other hand, they need to know that that's what I use. I use Facebook. I knew email. Question would be, how do we figure out? Right? Right. Exactly. So, th so there, there needs to be this interesting conversation, if at all possible. How do we make that kind of a, like a, a bridge, whatever it might be. You interact with them. All right, that's what I'm mean, saying. I mean, Very good. I mean I, most of the people I know who are most progressive mm -hmm. are 20, 30, and 40 years my, yes. my junior. Right. Not my age, but my junior. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to be there. And, but my goal is to always be relevant. So it's Very good. good. And sometimes, with, with all due respect, it ain't about how many. But I'll do that. No shade. You gotta, you gotta yeah. I'm sorry. It's not always still about how many. It's more about what you're trying to get done. And then also being beyond our usual suspects and our usual places we go, because we're out and around as well. Still here. Thank you. Final thoughts? That'll be the last question. Um, I'm good. Yeah, one more. Bob? All right. <laughs> one quick statement. Go ahead. Some people know Edward Halsbrook Hals here. Uh, he points out he runs information on the National Defense Appropriations Act every year. And they yeah, every year they stick women in there for registration, and every year they pull it out at the last minute. It happens in October, November. And I think one of the reasons is maybe all hell would break loose if they decided women had to register. Okay? So check that out. There's, there's, uh, of his on the table. I heard you talk about that before. That? Uh, there, there's leaflets on it in the back, and you can look up Edward Housebrook. He's got websites and a lot of information. I check him out all the time. Thanks. And I'll just wrap up with um, some big anniversaries everyone can participate if interested. It's the 100th anniversary of the War Resisters League. It's the 50th anniversary of the session we, uh, 55 years ago of the Institute, still working on that as well. Poor People's Campaign is still going on, organizing around farm workers, labor. I'm just trying to think, how, how do we intentionally figure out the what, where, how, when, and then figure out, if Jane Shulman did not come and ask me, have you ever heard about the War Resisters League? Would you like to come to a potluck? I would not be here. How many of us extend that invitation? And how many of us in our daily lives probably have no idea the impact we're having because of people around us as well? So I wouldn't shortchange ourselves in terms of the impact one can have being here as well. Thank you. We're going to continue the uh, informal conversations. There's food and drink in our community room, so feel free to get up, stretch, get something to eat or drink, hang out, enjoy the space. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to all the panelists.